Welcome to BizWire. Well, China's two meetings have ended in Beijing, with Xi Jinping assuming the presidency and Li Keqiang as premier, replacing 10 years of rule by Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. Of the multitude of issues facing China's economy, the steel industry was addressed directly during the Congress and will also be greatly affected indirectly through many of the policies that are likely to spur demand for the commodity. China's many steelmakers together have the largest capacity in the world, but much of this capacity uses outdated technology that wastes energy and produces a lower quality product. China's leaders are encouraging the industry to consolidate into a few major producers and hope to close smaller inefficient plants that contribute excessive pollutants to China's already dirty air. Official plans are part environmental and part economic. Well, profits in the sector fell 98 percent last year, with many firms making losses. Steel prices have suffered due to overcapacity and is another reason why the state is pushing closure and consolidation. State control may be another factor, as analysts say China has at least 900 million tons of crude steel production capacity, far higher than its official total output of 716 million tons last year. The government has said it would implement new policies to encourage mergers and close obsolete smelters with the aim of bringing 60 percent of total capacity under the control of its top 10 mills by 2015. The government has blamed smaller players for eroding the margins and market share of giant firms and its policies have been designed to encourage the big firms to swallow up smaller rivals. Growth in demand for steel in China, the world's biggest consumer, is set to rebound from a four-year low, supporting earnings for mills and the iron ore producers that supply them. Urbanization, the ongoing process of people moving to cities, has been given great attention by China's new leadership, especially Premier Li Keqiang, and is seen as a way to transform China to a consumption-based economy as opposed to its current reliance on exports and large state-directed projects. Infrastructure spending, though, on high-speed rail lines, subways, and other massive construction projects that the government will continue to support are seen as giving a boost to the struggling steel sector. The growth will benefit Valet, Rio Tinto Group, and BHP Billiton, the world's top three exporters of iron ore, as China plans to spend $105 billion, the most in three years, just on railways. The strongest start to passenger car sales in China since 2010 is also helping mills such as Baoshan Iron and Steel raise prices to the highest since June. He Wenbo, chairman of Baoshan, China's biggest listed steelmaker, said the urbanization process will generally support steel demand over the long run. Baoshan supplies half the steel used in cars and home appliances in China. Judy Zhu, a Shanghai-based commodity analyst at Standard Chartered, said steel prices in China may see a mild rebound in the second quarter as traders gradually destock their inventory and seasonal demand recovery begins to set in. She estimates that China's overall steel demand growth at 6 percent this year, in line with her firm's GDP growth forecast at 7.5 to 8 percent. China's top steel-producing province of Hebei, which surrounds Beijing in the north, plans to cut total capacity by 60 million tons in a move aimed at consolidating and cleaning up the chaotic sector. Overcapacity has been identified as one of the major challenges facing China's steel sector, with the China Iron and Steel Association routinely blaming small and privately owned mills, especially those in Hebei, for rampantly expanding their facilities and eroding sector margins. Pollution was a big topic for leaders at the party congress, and beginning in April, the steel sector is one of six major industries that will be targeted by the Ministry of Environmental Protection for special emissions restrictions. Hebei province is thought to be responsible for about a fifth of the airborne pollutants that drift into Beijing and bringing the province's ill-disciplined steel industry to heel is regarded as a key part of efforts to cut smog in the region. Wang Yifeng, head of China's biggest steel firm, the Hebei Iron and Steel Group, also said China needs to use environmental controls to rein in overcapacity. 
Steel production is an international issue and American imports of steel have been rising for the last three years and 2013 is expected to be no different. Rising imports have implications on demand for American produced steel and oversupply keeps prices down even in the face of rising demand. The firm U.S. Steel contends that much of the steel imported from China violates U.S. trade laws. Under these laws, duties can be imposed against dumped products, which are products sold at prices below that of producer's sales price in its home market or at prices lower than its cost of production. Now, countervailing duties can also be imposed against products that have benefited from financial assistance by a foreign government in production or export of the product. For many years, U.S. Steel and other producers have sought the imposition of such duties and in many cases have been successful. Others believe companies like U.S. Steel would be more successful to focus on innovation like with its partnership with Japan's Kobe Steel to produce light, ultra-high strength steel to be used in automobile manufacturing that will help to meet stronger fuel efficiency requirements. A newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry will visit China next month and trade will surely be at the top of the agenda which will include items like steel as well as bringing China into the TPP or Trans-Pacific Partnership.